he looked up at me with a puzzled face, and he said, huh. And that's normally not what you want to hear from a doctor. I was having my eyes examined, and he looked at me, and he said, Why, where are your glasses? And I said, I only wear them when I read. He said, hmm. It's time for you to admit you're getting a little bit older, and you need to wear them all the time. And I said, well, then... What about contacts? Would, would my eyes work with contacts? And one of the things you should know about me is I have very sensitive eyes. And I have very, I, I don't, I, when I was a kid, I hated going to the dentist and I hated going to the eye doctor. And they would put these drops in and I'd close my eye and one of them would have to hold my head and they'd have to bring in somebody else to pry my eye open. It just was not a pleasurable experience for me or for the medical professionals. And so I'm like, like, I don't want to wear glasses all the time, but would contacts work? And he said, absolutely. You're, you, can, you can get contacts now. I'm like, great. Sign me up. Let's do contacts. And he's like, well, so you know, there's an $89 one-time contact fitting fee. And I'm like, what is this racket? Because I'm a 65-year-old angry man, so I'm saying racket, right? I'm like, what is this racket? $89 to have a contact fitting fee? He's like, it's, it's only charged one time, and it helps, us, it helps us meet with the patient and help them learn how to put contacts in and out of there. I'm like, my wife's been doing this since she was nine years old. How difficult can this be? Well, I'm about to tell you something. I found out how difficult this could be for a man like myself with very delicate, refined, and sensitive eyes. And so I sat in that contact room, and they slid a pair of trial contacts over to me and said, now just put it on the end of your finger, peel back your eyelid. I'm like, hmm. I'm like, I'm not sure I can do that. They're like, you can do this. They're like, we just had an 11-year-old in here. They were in and out in 45 minutes. They said it takes everybody a little bit of time the first time, but you're going to be able to do this. And I said, Okay, I was not able to do it. An hour and a half in, I still had not gotten the first contact in my eye. And somehow, by God's miraculous grace, after I was there for two and a half hours, I had eyes that were entirely red, and I had two contacts in my eye. And they said, now you need to take them out. And I said, they're not coming out. And they said... <laughs> They said, legally, we have to see that you're able to get the contacts out of your eye before we let you leave here. And I said, well, buckle up, because we're pulling an all-nighter. I'm not, I'm not able to dig these bad boys out of my eyes. That's not happening. And so they went, and they got a little suction tool. And they, they took it, and they stuck it on the contact, and they pulled it right out of my eye. And I'm like, that was fantastic. Can I take that home as I practice? And they said, we're not supposed to do that, but yes, you can. <laughs> Just because they wanted me out of there. And so they gave me the suction tool. And as I was leaving, they said, we need to see you again on Monday. This was on a Thursday. They said, we're going to need to see you again on Monday uh, to make sure that you can get this. But don't worry. Don't worry. The person who normally does all of our contact fittings will be in that day. I would basically had the substitute teacher. And so I walked into that place on Monday like I was going to own the place. And normally they tell people, well, keep putting the contacts in your eyes. Take them in and out so you get used to them. But when you can't even get your contacts out of your eyes at the eye doctor, they're like, we're not even sending you home with a practice pair. You just come back Monday. And so I walked in. I'm like, yeah, all right, I got this. The real person's in here. She's trained. She's experienced. I've overcome this. She slides the contacts over to me, says, now remember, you were able to get them in on Thursday. I said, I got this. An hour later, I did not have contacts in either one of my eyes. She was exasperated to the point. She's like, you're a 30-year-old man. Lean your head back. I leaned my head back. She took her fingers, pried my eyeball open, forced the contacts in both of my eyes. I said, now do I have to take them out? She said, no, you'll figure it out. Go home. And so I went home. I went home. We had a newborn child at our home. I was in the bathroom for over an hour. My wife is knocking on the door. 
Are you okay in there? I'm fine. What's wrong? The contacts are stuck in my eyes. Take them out of your eyes. It's not that easy to take them out of your eyes. Brian, I've been doing this since I was nine. Just take the contacts out of your eyes. I'm like, I can't get them out of my eyes. Can you come in here and help me? Are you serious? You want me to come in and help you get contacts out of your eyes? That's what I asked for. Yes, please. She came in, and this is how much my lovely wife loves me. She stuck her finger in my eye to try to dig the contact out of my eye. And I'm like, what are you doing? You're, you're jabbing me in the eye with your finger and your nails. Get out of here. She's like, you just asked me to come in here. I'm like, never mind. Go away. And I shut the door and I locked it like I was a 10-year-old. And, and for the next hour and a half, I dug two contacts out of my eyes. And every time somebody would come check on me, I would just scream at them and tell them, get away from me. I don't want any help. And for the next 10 days of my life, I was one of the most miserable human beings to ever be around. If you ever find yourself living with a 30-year-old man who is getting contacts for the first time in his life, take a girl's trip, take the kids, and go away. But whatever you do, do not hang around for the next 10 days if he has sensitive eyes, because he will hate the world and you will hate him in the process. Now I'm happy to report that I can now put contacts in and out of my eyes and I don't need a suction cup and only rarely do Brooklyn and I get in a fight over it when I'm putting the contacts in my eyes. All because I went through the process where something was brand new to me and it was foreign but I I became a little more familiar with it and it got easier as, as time went on and I got better as it as 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 it happened. It's like anything else. When you first experience something, the learning curve is significant, and it's really difficult. And I had to go through training of putting my contacts in and out of my eyes for a period of time that is a lot longer than most normal people have to go through that. But I arrived, and I finally got there. This morning, we're going to be talking about something that comes on people, and it comes on people, and it's a brand new experience for them. And when it happens, there is no manual, and it can, it can be really, really life-altering all the time it is. But we're talking about parenting, and it is the hardest and the most rewarding experience of people's lives that you will ever face. And yet, we don't have to walk through this alone. And that's what's great. So this morning, we're going to look at some principles throughout the book of Proverbs and what we see about how we can be good parents. And the first principle we're going to look at, you can follow along in your phones or your tablets if you have them on the Bible app. It's a great resource. If you don't have that installed on your phone or on your tablet, go to the app store of your choosing. Type in Bible. It's the first one that pops up. Download it. It's completely free. There are hundreds of versions available for you. They're all free. There are great features. They'll send you a verse of the day. There's reading plans you can follow along. It's absolutely fantastic. So we have an event within the Bible app that you can find. You can follow along there, or you can just follow along on the screens if you'd like as we look at some different verses throughout the book of Proverbs as we see some principles about parenting. The first one we see is this from Proverbs 22.6. It says this, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, the first thing we have to understand is this. Parenting is hard. Parenting is hard. Sometimes we can be under the illusions that I'm going to have a miniature Brian and everything's going to be great because what the world needs is more of me. And so once the world gets a miniature me, everything's going to be great. And then what you realize very quickly after you have kids is, oh, wow, I've got a lot of work to do. This is going to be really, really, really difficult. And oh, by the way, once they grow up a little bit, they will be your mirror. And everything you don't like about yourself, you will see really clearly because they pick it up and they mirror it. And so the first thing we have to understand is that raising kids, parenting is hard. It's hard work. It is the most rewarding job ever, and yet it is incredibly difficult. And that's why at Lakeside, one of the things we've just resolved to do is we're not going to beat up parents. We're going to celebrate parents. We understand where you're at. We understand that it's really, really difficult. And so we're not, 
our, our goal is never to beat up parents and tell you all the ways that you suck and all the ways that you're failing. That's not what we're about. But we want to come alongside you and encourage you and walk with you and help you out because we understand that what you're experiencing and what you're facing is really, really difficult. Just as physical training is really, really difficult. Now, there are some people who, whose idea of fun is to run 20 plus miles. Now, why? I'm not really sure. But there are some people who just think, you know, I'm going to torture my body for the next three to four hours and the next three to four months leading up to this race, and I'm going to run 20-some miles. And if if you love to do that, that is great. You and I are, we're just from different worlds. But, but, But understand, what's that process like? Well, as you go through the process, you're constantly having to push your body. You're constantly having to go further. You're having to train your body to get used to it. And your body's having to, having to become stronger in a lot of areas, and it's having to react in different ways. This is, this is true of any physical training that you do. Working out and conditioning is never easy when you start. But if you stay with it for the long term, you see results. Parenting is never easy. It's never easy. But if you stick with it in the long term, if you are consistent, even on the days you don't want to be consistent, even in the times you feel like, I just want to take today off. I feel like it would be better if I just didn't have to deal with it today. I've got a lot of other pressure and a lot of other stress coming in my world. And the last thing I want to do right now is deal with the hard work of parenting. Go play video games for the rest of the night and don't talk to me. And then we'll, we'll try again tomorrow. If you put in the work, there are going to be days where, frankly, you don't feel like it because you are tired and you are exhausted. But if you stick with it and if you are consistent, it will be hard. There will be days you want to quit. There will be days you want to give them away. But if you stick with it, you will see results. You will see progress. But you've got to stay with it and be consistent. And you have to see long You have to stick with the program for long term. Now, there's two different approaches that parents can sometimes take that that can be damaging. And one is a a far-sighted approach. It's it's the unable to see things clearly up close. And when you're unable to see things clearly up close, everything's out there. So you're constantly worried about the college plan and where they're going to be when they get married and what's going to happen there. And you miss the here and now. And, and the other approach is the nearsighted approach where you're unable to see anything in the distance and you're just constantly trying to get through today. And, and when you have one of those approaches, what happens is you can put all of your focus either on that which is far away and neglect the here and now, or you can neglect entirely what's to come and put all of your focus on the here and now, and you, you don't put yourself in the best position. So as parents, we need to be alert of what's happening right now, but we also have to have a plan for where we want our kids to arrive in the long term. Parenting is a process. It's a process. And so as parents, our, roles, our role is the same as a parent, and yet how we function within that role needs to change. And there are really four stages of parenting. The first is a commander stage. And this, this stage can, can be the easiest in, in, for some people, and it can be the hardest for some people. But the commander stage is you get to tell your kid everything. You get to tell them what they eat, what they wear, when they go to bed. They don't have any say in the matter. And you're just like, this is the way it is, all right? You are going to wear this. You're going to go to bed here. This is what you're going to, this is when you have a baby or a toddler. You get to make all of the decisions. But if you're going to set your kid up for success, and the goal of parenting is always this, the best goal of parenting is to raise good adults is to raise good adults. And if that is your aim, to raise good adults, then you can't always stay in the stage. And this is where a lot of the conflict comes within the parent-child dynamic. It's their response and your response to one of these dynamics. And so if you're still treating a 17-year-old like the way you treat a 2-year-old, there's going to be friction in your home. And they're going to rebel, and you're going to constantly butt heads if you're trying to treat a 17-year-old in the same way that you treat a 2-year-old, where you dictate everything. But that's the first stage of parenting, the commanding stage. 
The second stage is this. It's to move from a commander to that of a coach. And it's to clarify rather than dictate. This is where you introduce the idea to the kid of you get to start to make some choices because everybody needs to understand how to make choices. They have to understand that there are consequences for our actions. They have to understand that in life, not very seldom are they going to walk through life where they have somebody dictate everything they have to do. And so if we want to build kids who are able to think clearly and who have the ability to make tough choices, we have to go from the commanding stage to the coaching stage. And this is where we can clarify, ask questions that clarify things. And so we ask our kids things like, would you rather do this or that? And you lay out the scenarios for them and you help them get to understand that they are going to have to make choices in life and those choices have consequences and they're going to have to live with the results of that. And then from that of a coach, you move to that of a counselor. And this is really for a lot of people within around the age of middle school. This is the stage when your kid is embarrassed that you even exist. The last thing they want in the world is their friends to know that they have parents. All right? For those of you who are in, who are in middle school right now, you have no idea how lucky you are. No idea how lucky you are. When I was growing up, uh, this, I'm an old man. When I was growing up, We did not have cell phones. And not only did we not have cell phones, we didn't have the internet. Which meant, if I wanted to get my game on with somebody that I had some feelings for, and I was like, yeah, you're you're pretty cute. And honestly, when you're in middle school, you're going through puberty, so everybody's pretty cute. But if you're like, all right, you're pretty cute, and you talked to me, and you actually talked back when I talked to you, that's exciting. If I wanted to spit some game, I had to pick up a house phone. All right. Now, for those of you who, who are in middle school right now, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But your phone, it was not a cell phone. The phone was literally wired into your wall, which meant while I was on the phone spitting game, if my mom picked up the phone to talk to her mother on the phone, she could hear her stud son talking, talking to a girl. I cannot tell you how embarrassing it would be if you're on the phone and all of a sudden you hear somebody pick up the phone and they don't hear what's called a dial tone, which again, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But there was actually a noise when you picked up the phone to let you know it was okay to dial on the phone to call somebody. And if somebody didn't hear that noise, they would speak into the phone and say like, hello? And I would just be like, hang up the phone, mom, hang up the phone, hang up the phone. I've got to go. I'll see you at school tomorrow or maybe never talk to you again. Bye. And hang up the phone. So for those of you who are in middle school, you don't even know. You don't even know the pain that I've had to endure in my life, all right? But you're at the stage right now where you don't even want your friends to know that you have parents. You just want them to think you're an alien and you just appeared in this world. And you're like, Dad, drop me off a mile away. I'll walk the rest of the way. We have 30 inches of snow in Wisconsin. That's all right. It's better risking frostbite than being seen being dropped off by you. It's okay. When, when you find yourself at this stage, parents, you've got to move to that of more of a counselor. And as your kids grow and mature and prove that they're capable of making good choices, this is where you find yourself. And you present it like this. Well, that's a decision you can make. But understand. And you make the consequences very clear. But what you're doing is you're giving them more freedom and you're allowing them to have have more of that understanding that they have to make choices. And then the last stage of parenting is that of a consultant. And this is really when your kids get to be in in college and, and later, and you have to let go. You have to let go, and you have to wait to be asked for input. And that can be really challenging because you still remember when they were a baby and they were getting poop everywhere. And so you're like, this kid isn't ready to make choices that are going to dictate the rest of their life. And yet they're 20 years old. And they want to make choices. They want to have that freedom. And so this can be one of the most challenging dynamics is you have to let go and move to that of being a consultant and wait until they ask for your input. And this can be especially a struggle for parents who are control freaks. 
and who want to call all the shots all the time. This can be really hard, but you've got to get to that point where there's a time you let go and you still love them like crazy, but you wait to be asked instead of just offering. Remember, the aim is to raise good, godly adults, not good kids. That's the long game, and that's the aim. Proverbs 27 says this, The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. Kids notice. They notice what you do. They notice the choices that you make. They see the you that the rest of the world doesn't get to see, and they will be a mirror. Kids pick up everything except how to sleep, all right? I mean, kids, my kids will repeat things to me. My kids now will, will mock me because they picked up some of the sayings that, that I used to mock my dad with when I'd pick up some of his skating. You're, you're on thin ice, son. You're on thin ice. I'm like, are so lame, Dad. I'll, I'll never say that. A couple days ago, I'm like, pow, you're on thin ice. And I'm like, who have I become? Like, what, what is this? I'm driving down the road next day, you're on thin ice, Dad. I'm like, who are you? Stop. No, no, just stop. Don't flaunt it. Don't show me how lame I am. But kids, they follow our examples, and they pick up everything except how to sleep because it doesn't matter. They refuse to learn that until they're teenagers, and then they need to catch up for all the time that they've ignored when they were little. But kids will notice you. They are your mirror. And if you see things in your kids that you don't like, chances are it's because it's shining a giant spotlight right back at you. The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. Why? Because they follow the example of the righteous, and the example of the righteous always points to God. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. And this is the part of parenting that that nobody likes, and this is the part that isn't fun, and yet it's never easy. It's never easy, but it's absolutely essential, and it's necessary. If you love your kids, you must discipline them. If you love your kids, you must discipline them. We've all seen what happens to the kids who've grown up and didn't have that discipline in place, and it never ends well. Your goal while your kids grow up is not to be their best friend. Your goal is not to be your kid's best friend. Now, as you go through different stages in life, and as life changes, then you can work on that relationship. And if once your kid has grown, you want to have a relationship more of like a friendship, that's the time that that relationship can be developed. But while your kid is growing up, your job is not to be their friend. Your job is to be their parent. And one of the things that is absolutely essential and necessary is for there to be discipline within that structure. And one of the things that can be incredibly damaging, incredibly damaging to kids, is when discipline is nothing but threats. And when there's a threat that if you do this, this is going to happen, and then you fail to follow through on the threat, what that conveys to the kid is that it's, it's not really, you don't really mean it. And what can happen is they can start to operate throughout life that way, thinking that any time somebody threatens something or any time there's a consequence that's that's presented, it's not actually going to happen. And so this can be incredibly, incredibly damaging to your kid if discipline is always a threat and it's never followed through. So be careful when you're raging what you threaten and make sure it's something that you can follow through with. If you threaten to throw away 
the PlayStation 4, understand you're not going to be able to play Red Dead Redemption 2 unless you just hide the PlayStation 4, and then you're going to have to, you're going to, have to unplug it and rehide it every time the game's done. So instead of in your rage saying, we're throwing away the PlayStation 4 if you do this again, say, you're not playing the PlayStation 4 again if you do this. Make sure how you present the discipline is something you can follow through with. And if you tell them you have two more chances 16 times, they know they don't, you don't mean it. And so whatever you threaten, whatever you present, make sure you can actually follow through. Whoever spares the rod, whoever spares the rod, hates his son. Hates his son. This is how integral Discipline is to the dynamic of parents and kids. And it's not pleasant at the time, but it's absolutely essential for their development. Why? Because we're trying to raise good, godly adults. Our goal is not to raise good kids. We want to raise good, godly adults. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. And then the last concept about parenting we're going to look at is this, from Proverbs 17, 6. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged, and the glory of children is their fathers. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged, and the glory of children is their fathers. Parents, I just want to talk to you just for a minute. Don't put yourself under so much pressure. You can try to be the perfect parent. And that's what we all want to be. I don't think any of us get into parenting and walk through and say, you know, my goal as a parent is to screw up my kid for the rest of their life. And just when people look at me and think, wow, he's the worst parent that's ever lived. I don't think any of us wake up with that goal. And you are going to make mistakes. There are things that you are going to do that you will regret. And if in 20 years you look back, when in 20 years you look back, there are going to be things you say, I wish I would have done that differently. I wish I would have changed this. I wish, you know, I would have understood this. But part of the way that you get that wisdom is through the learning process. And so don't be so difficult on yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Understand you are going to make some mistakes and understand that you are going to need grace. And oh, by the way, when you fail your child, admit it to them. Let them understand that it's okay to make mistakes. And when you make mistakes, in humility, you go and you apologize and you ask for their forgiveness. But let them see that humility modeled out of you. And in 20, 30 years from now, when your kids have kids, you will be a grandparent. And then you'll get to spoil those kids. And you'll have all that wisdom that you didn't have now. And you can put all of that into practice. And this is, the, by the way, the mark of a good relationship. When you have a relationship with your grown children. And I know that for some today, this can bring about wounds. I know for some that as you think back, it breaks your heart. Because when you close your eyes in your mind, you can see them so vividly. The picture of your six-year-old smiling at the beach. And somewhere, just ten years later, that smile was gone. And it's the point now, you don't even talk anymore. And you wonder, what happened? Where did it all go wrong? And it breaks your heart. And I know that there are nuances, and I know that there are dynamics at play, and I know it's, it's never just one person's fault. And I just want to encourage you here today, if this is just tugging at your heartstrings, and if you're like, this is just bringing up some fresh wounds, and this is really hard, because the people that I love so much about won't even talk to me anymore. I just want to encourage you with this. You can't fix everything in a day. And there is hurt 
and there's heartache there. But I want to encourage you with this. Call them, text them, send them an email, and just try your best to reopen the lines of dialogue and just start with this. I love you. Not I love you, but no, stop. It doesn't matter who's wrong right now. That, that will need to be worked on. And that will need to be discussed. And that process of forgiveness will have to go through if relationship is going to take place. But you, even if you are the person who has been wronged, you be the bigger person and start today and just write an email, send a text, s- take the time, do a phone call, and just say, I love you. And see if God will go to work in that space. Don't argue and don't fight. And if there needs to be conversation, if there needs to be forgiveness, then set that up. There may need to be therapy. You may need to have a counselor involved. And be willing to go through that. But life is too short. And I understand that there are some toxic relationships. And I understand that there are some times where you just have to cut it off. I do understand that. And yet I also understand that there's a lot of times we build up issues in our minds to say to ourselves, these are toxic because we just want to be right. And even if it's a toxic relationship, we can start with I love you. And it might not go anywhere. But maybe God will use that opening and start to heal some wounds in our hearts and the hearts of our kids. Parents, you have an incredible responsibility and an incredible opportunity. And we here at Lakeside Understand that it's primarily your responsibility to raise your kids according to the principles of God's word. And so we are here to be your cheerleaders. We are here to be your advocates. We are here to support you and encourage you and help you any way we can. But we celebrate you and we're excited that we get to be a small part of the journey alongside you. God, I pray that you'd help us. I pray, God, that you'd help every parent here. I pray that you'd help us see clearly. That, God, we wouldn't wouldn't lose sight of what the ultimate goal is. God, I thank you for the lives of these nine kids that were about to stand beside their families as they dedicate them to you. And and God, we just thank you for them and we celebrate that. And God, I pray for the fresh wounds here and the broken hearts as well. And I pray, God, that a phone call or a text or an email just simply says I love you would break down walls would pierce to the heart. Be a source of encouragement. I pray, God, that you'd give the parents patience for the kids who are trying them. I pray, God, for the kids who are on the parents' last nerve, that you would just, you'd just help them remember it's a process. And, God, we pray that each parent would do their best to model your love and your hope to their kids. In your son, Jesus' name we pray, amen.